they compare it to scrum. The big thing is usually sprint or no sprint. They're not too dissimilar. It's about time boxing. It's about trying to maintain focus, mm. that misunderstanding of deferred commitment. Uh, there's a certain point in our workflow that we want to keep work behind. It can pile up there. Yeah. And then once it crosses that line where we're, as a delivery capability say, we're going to let that in, then we're going to fully commit to getting it through as quickly as possible. People will often think, oh no, it's a set limit and it's there forever. When really we're just trying to experiment with how we keep flow going. <laughs> How can Teams get started with Kanban? This is a question that drops into my inbox every so often. So I thought, why not speak to an expert? That expert today is Matt Turner, who has years of experience helping Teams implement Kanban. This is a really detailed conversation, which I hope you get as much out of as I did. So Matt Turner, welcome. Thank you for coming as well. Thanks for asking me to be around, Jack. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to having a chat. Now, you just dropped a massive bombshell that you were a hip-hop scratch DJ. So we'll, we'll park that for a second. So this is the part where I've uh, ripped off your LinkedIn profile. Super. And we see when was the last time you reviewed it based on the reaction. Okay. So you help organizations and teams evolve better services and products using lean, agile ways of working. Um. You're a partner, a business agility coach and trainer, highly experienced, accredited Kanban trainer and organizer of an online meetup group, Lean Agile UK, and also Lean Agile Stockport. Yeah, so the Lean Agile UK and Lean Agile Stockport, that's sort of, that's um, in the past now. Okay. Um, the meetup group that I organize now is, um, um, you, you may have heard, Sooner Safer Happier. Yeah. Um, so around the better value, Sooner Safer Happier sort of tenants of um of john smart et al and, and their book sooner safer happier so we're growing a community that um that uh you know coming together to appreciate that that approach on probably devops is probably the closest sort of uh you know textbook type yeah to in terms of agile thing that it's close to fair enough we'll get into that no yeah. doubt but rewinding back slightly tell us a bit about how you got to the point of sitting here today without skimming over superstar dj <laughs> Matt Turner. <laughs> yeah, try yeah, try my best. Um yeah, so I've been in IT for probably twenty seven years. Um started up in service desks. Um I I got into work really sort of straight away after after A levels really. So I didn't I didn't go on and do a degree. Um and in that period of my life, basically, you know, the the biggest things in my life were um probably earning money um either by going to work and working on a on an it service desk or um spending that money buying records hip-hop uh funk soul and um and playing out of an evening um you know thursday through to saturday um yeah so i and and got into that when uh for a brief period in my life we uh as a family moved to uh, the west country yeah um so i was knocking around bristol and the local area um fell in with of all people a uh, massive attack because they were uh playing in clubs near me and um i actually in actual fact the club nearest to me was a chap from warrington who was ginger and we were both growing curtains which is how i became known to him and uh and then he allowed me to play at his club that he was running and wow. so a massive attack. So I sort of fell into it there, really. And then that's, you know, that's a lovely springboard to have at a young age. Yeah, yeah. Getting into that sort of thing was having mentors like that. So. Still in contact with them or? Um, not really. No, no. You know, everything, everything moves on, doesn't it? So I'm more grown up now. I tend to just, it's just like Team Turner is like my uh, three kids and my wife, Dinah, are the things that take up most of my life. So I don't have much time for anything else. But, are we going to um, get a global groundbreaking bit of gossip here about Banksy and Massive Attack. Can you confirm those rumours? Uh, I can't. So, yeah, it was a very well-kept secret. I had friends who were Banksy's friends. Okay. Um, and one of them, very unfortunately, um, died of an asthma attack. A, a, a friend of mine called Abby who I went to sixth form with. And so in a couple of his books, there's a mural um, oh, wow. dedicated to Abby. Um, and she kept that secret very, very well. Oh, she knows, yeah, she didn't let on. What an interesting start. You learn something new every day. You yeah. still scratch at home? You still got records? Um, or are they, they collecting dust on the shelf? I've still got my records. They, they're, they're sort of, I've got about, I don't know, about, uh, about 6,000 records. 
Um, so yeah, still keep them. Um, I did move my turntables on a little while ago and I'm sort of thinking at some point in the future, my kids went through a period of like, I did get them down out the loft, started doing it again. And, but my kids were at that age where Dinah was like, there's too much swearing in that, take it off. So, um, Fair enough. you know, that's hip hop for you, isn't it? So, but I'll probably return to it at some point. So from the service desk to what you're doing now, what was that? bit in between like how did you get into the whole agile thing you were i don't want to presume but you may have been getting into work when the whole manifesto was probably written or there or thereabouts um a little while before yeah i'm, I'm i don't look as as uh, old as i as my actual years do i know thank you very much um no so i sort of about 95 I, I got into being in the service desk um and so that's probably the first uh, 15 or 12 years or so of, of my uh, working life in IT was all about IT service management, um, you know, the qualifications that you might get, unlike nowadays, you know, you know, there's a lot of qualifications around Agile. Back then, it was a lot of ITIL stuff, yeah, um, and that's service management and operations. Um, so I, yeah, so I, I got into I got into the service desk. I sort of tried to go that technical route because I think you know, uh, as a youngster, you try to chase some of the money. Where's 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 your progression going to lie? Did a few Microsoft exams and so on. Uh, found out I was well. I knew this anyway from school. I'm good at passing exams, so I got all my you know yeah. MCSE and all that sort of stuff. You wouldn't let me anywhere near you, your uh, server farm or or you you know your workstations really. And then, you know, as, as time goes on, actually what I was looking for was more responsibility for people and processes yeah. and teams and stuff like that. Um, so sort of continued on, on, on that route for a little while until I got my first sort of management role, team leader role and management role in that sort of uh, arena. And um, yeah, so after I'd been there, after I'd been in that, in that type of environment for, as I said, well, just over a decade, then I, um, I moved to a, another company that was going through an agile transformation and um and it was not not too far away in north wales money supermarket um and they were going through their agile transformation and it was a real eye opener and then um whilst being there uh like I, I, as luck would have it a chap sauntered through the door as as often do and um it was a chap named ian carroll and he'd this was in the early days of Kanban. I'm sort of known for being a, 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 yeah, we'll a person who, who, who likes, loves Kanban and uses Kanban a lot. Um, and Ian had had been introduced probably a year or so earlier um, by um, um, by Carl Scotland had had been working together and, and introduced it to him. And um, that was a pretty much an era defining moment, not for just for me, but probably also for uh, Money Supermarket where we both were and, and sort of. Kanban spread through there like wildfire. Um, what brought you into, or oh, sorry, what attracted you to to Kanban? I think I think uh, the way it deals with complexity. So working in an operations team, working in service operations, service management, uh, and in the service, it's this all it's high volumes. Yeah. Um, it's the production environment. Um, so I think in operations, there's always that sense of, um, you know, you've got no money. And you've got massive high volumes that are like the, the, the doors always open because you've got service desk tickets coming in that people can, you yeah. know, self-generate and so on. So there's a, there's a huge amount of complexity. And, um, and what I've often said about Kanban is it, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily, you know, fix all of that. It, it's, I've often said that it's like, it's like a mindfulness. Um, so it helps you make sense of it amidst all of the hustle and bustle mm. and keeps you centered and, and sort of calms you down. So. What was brilliant about Ian is he just wandered through, as I sort of do now, wandered through the whole building, being inquisitive. What are you doing? What are you doing? Um, you know, here's, here's, have you ever thought about X, Y, Z? You know, sort of some sort of Kanban aphorism to say, Here, here's what can you can, how you can get on top of some of that um, yeah, yeah. volume and so on. So one of the things I definitely admire about you is you were very transparent in showing the journey that you were taking your teams on with, um, at the same time being sensitive to the client and, and so on yeah. and so forth. And the level of detail, some of your LinkedIn posts especially used to go to, is like, wow, this can really make a difference. And here's an individual who can stand behind the work he's doing, which sometimes, you know, the um, 
you know, the, the ecosystem of LinkedIn and especially in the agile community, we can eat each other from the inside sometimes. So yeah, props to you for, for sort of standing behind and, and showing you, showing your workings out. Um, was that an easy thing to do or is it something you just instinctively did because it was a good idea to, to prove this stuff works? Yeah, I think, well, so yeah, it was instinctive. Um, my mum always used to say that like, um, when I was, a when I was a kid and we were getting on the bus, I'd just talk to all, you know, everyone and all in sundry and, um, uh, like I'd walk up to like old guys waiting for the bus and just chat to them and stuff yeah. like that. So there's a, there's an, there's an earnestness to it. Um, um, and sometimes nowadays, now I'm a bit older, actually in organizations that, that can be, a, um, it can, it, it can be a pro and a con that you, you know, you feel at ease, yeah. um, sort of speaking your mind maybe. Um, but essentially like in that, those early days of LinkedIn, um, which, you know, I live my life through LinkedIn. So, um, that is my favorite, uh, form of social media. Whereas I think, I think it is a bit more tempered than some of the other forms you know there's an element of um of um propriety and and, and, and business culture to mm. it but i do get what you mean about people sort of rip each other apart on, on all of these things but i was just yeah basically um with the with the blessing of the of the organizations that i was supporting at any given moment sort of saying there's lessons to be learned here yeah um and i think so i've, I've been um you know you might call it like an autodidact i've been someone who 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 likes to learn things but not in sort of the structure of a of an educational institution, which is why I didn't go on to higher yeah. education and so on. And um and like th th this was the act of doing that. Um, so not only was I trying to share the things that I've been doing, um, in order to help people see that these things could be done and the usefulness of them, I was also I've, I've um sometimes I'll I'll quote um uh, the chap who wrote Passage to India, E. M. Forster, and he's got a lovely quote that's um how do I know what I think until I see what I say? Mm. So there's always an element of, um, I was running it past people yeah. and I thought there's a massive audience there that can check me out, you know, can, can go, yeah, well, actually, no, we won't get that from what you've just said. And, and I could get that feedback from it. Yeah. And I think because of the earnestness of it, how it came across and, and what I was putting out there, actually the, um, the responses were, were really lovely. Yeah. You know, uh, the high percentage of, of, of niceness coming, coming back. So I think part of that, is because of how accessible it was. Like I, I felt like, because you went through like a, you were doing it quite consistently. I'm not saying you don't do it now, but there was the, you were showing those data points on a on a consistent basis, and it was easy for the for the reader to follow that journey in an accessible way because you were breaking it down. Where sometimes, you know, cumulative flows and scatter plots are, are, are not that easy to understand especially if you're, you're coming into it quite fresh so it was nice to see someone like i said showing those receipts of this is what i've done this is what i've learned and this is the proof of what the the client is is sort of um seeing from it yeah so um yeah you sort of died down with that sort of stuff is that fair to say it, yeah i think so sometimes it um i mean some of these things are habitual aren't they? like mm. the human nature thing is if you're doing a lot of them it's easy to put it out and then um and as I sort of said, it, it does rely on the um, the charitableness of the uh, of the client, yeah, you know, and, and how into it they are. And sometimes I've spent um, like longer periods of time at, at certain clients who who are either less inclined to want to share that sort of stuff, or the works started to change as well. Mm. Um, so you know, there's an element of uh, being a victim of your own success a little bit, I suppose of of then starting to get into more complex more moving yeah. closer to the boardroom having more influence and um and then some of the conversations that you're trying to influence using agile approaches and so on yeah. um they can be a bit more sensitive so I've, i'm always looking for what what are those nuggets at a, at a, at a team level that can really uh, kickstart a team into being able to um utilize these tools and yeah. principles and approaches and so on and they, they, they get the most um the quickest sort of feedback and the biggest the best response i think yeah a lot of the other stuff ends up and i, I do sort of post some of the other stuff and it's less frequent but it it, it feels a bit more uh, academic or theoretical yeah, yeah. when yeah. it's at that sort of level yeah that's fair 
Um, when you go into an organization and you start sort of talking about flow and Kanban, where do you start? Because I feel like with Scrum, it's it's quite it's a quite a nice package of stuff. You start here, this is what it is, these are the events, this is what it's all about, this is the training that you go on, so on and so forth. Where where do you where does one begin with with Kanban going into an organization? Yeah, I mean what what I love about Scrum is that um it it it's it gives you sort of like you say, like the package. So you can introduce like a green field. Kind yeah. of, you can wipe something clear and go, right, here's a green field. Here's how we'll build it from the ground up. What, what I then love about Kanban is that it's really comfortable brownfield. Yeah. Like, so the whole sort of start with where you are now um, is that that's really my in, in point. And you don't need a lot of cooperation mm. really in this day and age. You know, um, you don't need the upfront buy-in. Um, because there's ways and means of getting the buy-in by really holding up the mirror that Kanban yeah. can give you. Um, and so what I'll usually do is I'll usually start with, there are always conversations about how a team feel they're performing. There's always some form of understanding about how everyone outside of the team feels they're performing. There's always that sort of, you know, the word on the street is, yeah. or these are the grumblings from the other people, whatever. Um, and what I usually do is go straight to the data. Um, so everyone has a workflow tool. Mm. Um, not everyone uses it as a workflow tool. You know, usually it's just a system of record and we dump ideas in there. Um, and then so these very powerful tools will capture some data and I usually bring it out and s start plotting some of those graphs and then start interpreting them in front of the people who, you know, are doing the work and sort of show them that, well, if I was to look at this data, which is, you know, it's, it's data you've captured, mm. it's, it's your data, it, it describes how you behave, this is how I'd interpret it. Um, and often there's a big eye opener there. Um, what it doesn't necessarily do in the first instances is, is show them um, actually how brilliant they are at doing things. What it usually shows is, is where tools are concerned, people don't really like them, and there's a lack of discipline in using them. Yeah. Um, but if you can show people that gap and you sort of say to them like, um, you know, it's lucky I came along and pulled this out because um, the CEO bought you this tool yeah, yeah. and the CEO can access it whenever they want. And uh, she might look at it and go, oh, this is all load of rubbish. I don't need these people. But I'm showing you now how you can interpret it. And usually the first thing that happens in that conversation is, well, maybe we should be a bit more, um, you know, true to when we start a piece of work, we'll click start. When we stop a piece of work, we'll click yeah, stop. Yeah. And then we'll really start to see how effective we are. And we'll also start to see where we might improve. So just that first behavioral change gets people interested in how data can represent them. Yeah. You know. So when you go into somewhere that may have tried implementing Kanban or certain aspects of it, where have they normally gone wrong? So what do I mean by that? So some people think post-its on a board is Kanban. Like what, when you go into somewhere to try and help and pick some of that snake's wedding, what are the common themes, if you like? Yeah, so I think I think you, you know, generally that's that's the first um, problem that people have is that they think putting people on a board. I think actually no, it's more it's more because that they um, uh, compare it to Scrum. Mm. So actually, the big thing is usually sprint or no sprint. Yeah, sprint or sprintless, um, and so that's the confusion when really what we're talking about is um you know they're not they're not too dissimilar it's about time boxing it's about trying to maintain focus mm. um and um, so what what would probably usually happen is that misunderstanding of of deferred commitment yeah. like uh, there's a certain point in our workflow that we want to keep work behind uh, you know have it it can it can pile up there yeah and then once it crosses that line where we're we as a team as a as a delivery capability say we're going to let that in then we're going to fully commit to getting it through as quickly as possible um and i think people don't really understand that de um, deferred commitment thing about keep it back there and then actually you know let let stuff in as your whip limit dictates yeah i think another thing as well people get hung up on is whip limits mm. Um, that you know, I would I would often talk to people about. Well, they're levers. That you're what you're saying is you'll let work in or keep work out, and you can put that up and down based on what's happening around yeah. you. People will often think, oh no, it's a set limit and it's there forever. 
um, when really we're just trying to experiment with how we keep flow going based on everything that's going on around us. Really practical question, because I'm putting myself in the shoes of someone watching this. What is the best way to come up with an initial whip limit? Um, so in my experience, um, and I, do, I work with a lot of teams that are um, uh, 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 trying to contend with high volumes. Mm. Um, my usual advice is just much less. Yeah. Um, usually when we sort of do a count of how much how much work is in there and we sort of start to talk about orphaned work, mm. work that's in your workflow that you've ostensibly told people you're committing to. And if you've told someone you're committing to it, then they think you're doing something. Try and figure out what number of things have nothing being done on them right yeah. now, any given moment. Um, have a conversation with your stakeholders about that and move it back into the options, you know, before the commitment point. Or, or you know, have a moratorium. Don't let anything else in until that's back to, you know, you've got everyone's doing something. Um, and then you just play around with, do we need a bit of a buffer? Do we need a bit more than that? Yeah. Um, and just play around with that. And 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 the, the thing about it is, is that it will, it should be, it should be fairly volatile because it's, because what you're trying to do, any given moment, is contend with your external forces, um, you know, and keep them at bay with the whip limit. Yeah. Um, if you have an influx of people or talent or someone comes back from a course and knows more stuff or, you know, you get uh, a dependency on another team goes away so you've got access to more capability, then you should probably let more work in. Again, it's, it, it, you know, it's, uh, it's dynamic. You mentioned like, when, we were, when we were sort of warming up, limbering up, you mentioned the the Venn diagram of agility, agile, and politics. I think you've done a few yeah. bits of writing about that. Would you mind explaining what what your thoughts are? Yeah, where, yes. Where that link is in your mind? Yeah, absolutely. Well, so uh, as time's gone on, I I, I can see. Uh, I think you've just become aware of more things, and I think the the age we're living through, um, you know, it's it's a really interesting time. That, that we're living through um we're coming to maybe an inflection point of 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 a real shift in how people think about the world around them uh, and i think probably one of one of the buzzwords of that i've been hearing a lot lately is like things like anti-growth mm. like we're understanding the globe can only uh, provide us with so many things um and and we can't extract as much as we've been extracting out of it before now. Um, and so people's political agendas are changing. Um, and I think that's very much like, you know, the, the, the organization or an enterprise is, a, is just a subsystem of that larger global system. Um, how people uh, cooperate within an organization, it's only gonna mirror or be very similar to how people come together and cooperate in in the in the wider world yeah um and so you know agile for me is 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 part of that vocabulary of like within organizations the, the agile for me when it started it was sort of it it, it was a political movement i mean it has a manifesto mm. um you know to my knowledge and my understanding it was it was born out of uh expert practitioners um valuable people who, who knew a lot about doing this thing that was growing and growing like delivering software um feeling a bit exploited feeling a bit put upon um and therefore you know like interesting isn't it like like oh history might not repeat itself but um it often rhymes that you know part of the reason Ag the agile manifesto came together is like you you might walk into offices and you'll see scenes of developers um sleeping under their desks yeah you know, and, and flip forward sort of 20 odd years and we've seen scenes in on Twitter, of Twitter, with developers sleeping under their desks. Mm. Um, which again, so that sort of like mirrors what's happening in the in the outside world. So um, so yeah, I've written things about, you know, office, pot what, what are we here for as agile coaches? We're here to help people make a change um, from how, work may be being managed in a very uh um, we use a tailoristic mm. uh as a as a word a lot don't we like frederick Wilmslow taylor about you know um in earlier in last the last century some big technological advances were made 
and um, and were exploited because they were there to be exploited. And um, when when those advances were made, people were seen more as um, as part of a machine. Um, and agile and agility and and things, you know, Scrum in the eighties and then XP in the nineties and then um, you know Kanban in the two thousands and the Agile Manifesto coming together was all about putting that humanity back in. Mm. Um, and I think we've got, uh, you know, we've got a really good opportunity as agile coaches to, to, to fight for that humanity, to bring it to people's attention, um, to make decisions more democratic. Um, because in terms of like growth, um, there isn't, there isn't a lot of growth to be made now. I think we think from the globe, there's not a lot of extraction to be made. So organizations using these practices to extract more, um, it, it'd be nice to sort of set the agenda on, well, we can't get, there's, there's no more tangible value to extract from the globe. So actually this is all about perceived value now. So let's uh, raise the focus on um, maybe producing less, but having a better time doing it. Mm. You know, uh, happiness is, is, a, is, a, is a great, um, you know, dial to, to keep a track of. Is that um, how you got involved with the better value sooner safer happier movement yeah i would suppose yeah i suppose so um how i probably actually got involved is um around around about the same time as the post you've mentioned earlier about me showing my working out mm. um john smart was was um was probably doing the, the the nascent book was in his medium blogs um when he was still at barclays bank um, so that would have been probably about seven or eight years ago, maybe, um, maybe a little bit less. And, um, and he saw my, so that was just, you know, me getting the attention of those people who might give me some feedback and yeah. can I find those people who think like me and yeah. And John got in touch. And so we'd always sort of been in contact throughout that whole period of time. And, and, and then in the intervening period of time, he's put those, um, uh, blogs together blog articles together and, and created the book so yeah i think I, not that like that way of thinking attracted me to soon safe happy i think just um w earlier on we were attracted and and those interactions um uh, probably encouraged both of us to be to feel more like this way yeah mm -hmm. and, and and you know and 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 um push to the fore that humanity that what I love about Better Value, Sooner Safer, Happier, and the book Sooner Safer, Happier, is that happier's front and center on it. it. It has to be. What I loved in the early days of learning about Kanban and, and Mike Burroughs' books, yeah. um, and especially Kanban from the inside, um, you know, you can't go three pages without seeing the word humane or humanity. And for someone to put it, to weave it into that narrative so much, uh, clearly it's important. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can dig that. I'm down with it. How do you uh, go into an organization and make the human side of it front and center when sometimes, you know, let's be realistic, there's a day rate involved and there's probably a statement of work. How? So this is a better question, right? How do you, how does one go about building humanity into a statement of work or in your experience? Um, I, so I, I, so I, I don't put it in, I don't put it in the statement of work. Um, so what's interesting then is there's not there's not a, a small amount of anxiety about that. Um, I often have people um, say of me that um, I'm clearly a principled character. It's a compliment, I think, isn't it? Well, it, it might be, yeah, it might be, and it, it sort of depends on on how comfortable they are mm. with the principles that I right. uphold, I suppose, um, and whether it whether they're delivering to them the value that I see in those principles mm. delivering. Um, so usually in the statement of work, there's a description of, um, you know, the method, the practice, what, what is expected to happen and what we think we can achieve. And we all, we both sign up to that. Um, <clears throat> then when the, uh, you know, the rubber hits the road and they actually see that, um, see that working, then, you know, people by people. So when, so when they can observe you as a person, how you get those things done, yeah. then they can really sort of make that decision. Um, and I'm, so I am, I am principled. And, and, and I see that as like, you know, like you say, it's sort of a compliment. It should be a compliment. Um, the practices that we uphold, agile, is, it is principled. Mm. It has 12 principles. Um, scrum, 
Kanban, XP, all have principles and, and mostly all have values associated with them. Um, and I think those, those principles and values, they just form your decision architecture. Like given a, given a crossroads or a, or a fork in the road, yeah. they help you make a decision in a certain way. Um, and so, and, some, and you can bend those principles if you think, well, in this given, op at this given juncture, it won't uphold the value that I'm looking for. And what are those principles of yours, if you don't mind sharing? Um, well, so the, um, at the forefront is, is that it's, it's got to be good for people. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'll often, I'll often go into, a, into an organization and, you know, everyone in that organization is, is trying to do the best by everybody else. Um, but then in, in large organizations, um, there are lots of different forces that not everybody can see. And here's one of the lovely things about, uh, about Agile, about Kanban, about those sorts of things is we try to make all of that transparent. Mm -hmm. Um, we try and create those flows of information. You can't have a flow of value really, or, or rather it's hindered. The flow of value is hindered if you don't have flows of information. And, and how do you uh, progressively bigger organizations keep everyone um, updated with what's happening? And, uh, you know, like that one of, that's one of the other things that I love about Kanban is like, you know, um, practice number one is, is visualization. Even, even though that practice in the first instance of Kanban ever, uh, there, were, there weren't any visualizations, mostly just data and policies. Mm. Um, but the fast follow on was, well, visualize because it does all the heavy lifting of of communicating yeah um and you know I, and i do believe that people don't don't just like being told um they like to see show me um and so when you start to bring that transparency um usually you can bring people together with you um and it makes it more humane if you can explain to people why you're doing certain things you can do that in an easy way and you can show them um it takes away a lot of the anxiety for them uh, what probably where sometimes, um, you know, it doesn't always go to plan is that, is that you, you, I might just come in and, and I'm a bit ahead of, uh, a bit too far ahead. I'm always probably a bit ahead. We should mm. be, shouldn't we? Yeah. We should be showing people the way, but I might be too far ahead of what the comfort level of yeah. how we're showing people what's going on. Um, and you have to be very sensitive to that. So. Yeah. That interesting. I had a, I had the mirror held up to myself yesterday. Um, there was a, a very um, large community of practice ramp up. And I was listening to some of the conversations and then my, my bias was, oh my God, this is, this is painful. This is like Billy basic stuff. But then I had to sort of rein it back in and say, well, just because I've heard it a hundred times doesn't mean everyone else has. And I sort of had to check myself. And I think, yeah, listening to you, you have to you have to keep yourself in line sometimes because you might be you know a bit further ahead. not ahead as in like an arrogant way but just time knowledge yeah experience and you have to sort of not have that arrogance and have that chip on your shoulder that everyone's on the same page yeah definitely yeah definitely i mean there's a there's an, like you say about those things that you, ha you you know you're constantly introducing things that like you or i might have learned over a decade ago mm. and have been using for a good long while um, but it's going to be new to someone else, isn't yeah. it? And it's like just remembering that actually what you're looking for is the delight in their eyes as it's yeah, making yeah. sense, which can give you the thrill, yeah. isn't it? Which then makes it a, a new, doesn't it? It makes it a fresh for you. It's like, I'm not just trotting out some not putting know, the tape aphorism. In it. Yeah, yeah. Um, outside of the sort of agile Kanban bubble, what else do you think uh, is important for people to be focusing on? Yeah, anything outside of the agile. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yeah, um, as, well, my mind goes back to it. so. Um, like recently, the prime minister's put a big push on maths, mm. and, uh, and I saw something with Simon Pegg, um, sort of um, getting really upset by that because I don't. I think he, like me, hasn't had that higher education. Yeah, same. Um, Very hard to relate to that. I thought for me personally. Yeah, yeah, and 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 um, and so Simon Pegg sort of said like, no, it's the arts, you know, uh, and and I think that a lot. So. So some of my other posts every now and again, and, I, and again, I've sort of dropped off with this, but I've got lots of ideas for some, for a new set. Is, um, I, I'll often uh, post about um, what I call Netflix and skill. 
which is basically watch it and it's not always on that streaming channel or the channels are available yeah um but just like movies i like movies um and i'll post about movies and obviously art imitates life mm. that's what we draw from um so it's just a thing about well get have some escapism but also think about you know how these interactions that you're seeing um on the screen relate back to problems that you see at work and so on um and that to me is like that's the essence of we need the arts what we're the field that we're in is is a creative problem solving field mm. the arts seeks to uncover problems confront problems and give um you know not necessarily solutions but ideas about what could be done about those things and um and you don't get that purely from from science i think you know we do fetishize science is uh one of those um cognitive biases i think called, like physics envy we seek to simplify stuff and that we could just work it out like mm. one plus one equals two everything's going to be a bit like that um and actually when you get humans involved and emotions involved one plus one doesn't equal two um and we have emotions and therefore if you look at the arts and so on um then that helps you helps it helps us as humans i think work out what our emotions are and what we can do with them um and i think as well like so like like you know podcasts and and things like that so um you know what podcasts do i listen to well mostly comedy yeah which ones any <laughs> um, any, any shout outs yeah well i do i do like uh smartless okay um i've been i've been listening to uh um uh david spade and dana carvey on uh that they do one about everyone who's been through saturday night live and so on okay. it's called fly on the wall it's called my favorite one um podcast that i tune into is the blind boy podcast okay what's um that? so blind blind boy boat club a member of um uh, an irish band um called the rubber bandit um and they're sort of like a a, a rap satire uh rap group um but he generally he so he's it's morphed into he does a lot of uh, a lot of his podcast podcast is very popular um a lot of it it centers around mental health and how he gets on with the world uh, and he's sort of he's, he's neurodivergent so he has some really good interesting views on that um but also you know he talks about everything from food to clothes to it's very funny so it's very comedic um and yeah it's just a really great take on life so and it's it's got nothing to do with what I do with my every day, mm. but it's got everything to do with what I do with my every day sort of thing, you know, how people get on with one another, how people cope with their emotions and so on. Um, so that's really good. And then a couple of other things that I probably do that are sort of more professional, but from a sort of different angle, uh, um, I quite like like behavioral science podcasts, things like Nudge and um, uh, with Phil Agnew and um, I love listening to and watching Rory Sutherland as well so his Ogilvy stuff um, because I think there's a real I don't know who said but someone said I'm sure that we're all salespeople, aren't we we're all we're all selling something and I think as agile coaches and as ad agile practitioners we're selling an idea of there's a better way yeah um, and whether it's true or not that there's a better way we might use data to give people facts mm. but people don't change their mind because they see facts they change their mind because you connected to them in a certain way and i yeah. think we can learn a lot from marketing about that so yeah those are the things i sort of tune into yeah and how do you find the the balance of of that i suppose in terms of because I, I struggle with should like there's a pressure isn't there to read every book to read every sort of blog that's out there to watch every video and to be fair that probably will push the needle for the client a bit further but at the same time as you've just alluded to and described there's this whole pot of creativity that will know although not directly linked is gonna is gonna push that needle even probably even a bit further and then you've got your family and you, you yeah. know your your home life to, to balance as well do you ever you know struggle with that side of things the pressure yeah. of wanting like filling the, the knowledge bank up yeah yeah oh, definitely and i think that pressure a lot of that pressure comes out of things like you know there were um there were a lot of people putting their super ideas down in in book form and and so on and and you know all power to him because i i'm not sure i could do that. i think i'm too scatterbrained mm. um to be able to to do that and and then there's an immense pressure on 
people like you and I and, and people we associate with in, in our game to have read those books and, and so on. And I think um, we can choose not to put that pressure on us. I yeah. think we learn like, like, so all of those things like watching films or reading articles, we learn a lot. I think one of the, and, and this gets spoken of a lot probably is that, you know, it's often said that in business, um, it's really good to be a storyteller. Mm. And I think, and I think oh, you and I can relate to that and, and we're here and, you know, you and I have both done, have tried to, again, like try to tell that story through posts, through social media, we're, yeah. we're working out stories. And when we do that by practicing telling our stories um, and we take ideas from anywhere and then just replay them through our own filter. Yeah. And, um, and we get, you know, varying responses, mostly positive responses wow, to those. Yeah. So that's Sometimes good. Sometimes it goes terribly wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it has, <laughs> it has done for me in the past, but, um, I think that, you know, as long as people are realizing that about, you know, you've got a story to tell, so try and tell it and you will draw from all of those sources. I've, I've shared every now and again, there's that story, isn't there, about um, Umberto Eco's library. Um, and I don't know whether it's ever the picture for it on social media or on the internet. I don't know if it is his actual library, but there's a, a lovely library with loads of, loads of books in there. And, um, you know, people have been to visit Umberto Eco there the novelist and and writer and and said have you read all the books and he's in and they always say have you read all the books and he said he said no no these are the ones i've read this week and it's thousand these are the ones i've read this week um or, or i'm reading next week the ones in my office are the ones i've read this week and just as a joke to like break that thing and he describes that library and those books and i've got a lot of books that i dip into and dip out of i'm not mm. read cover to cover is like a library's there for you to be able to, you're not expected to have read all that library yeah you're not expected to have committed it to memory. It's if you've if you've appreciated who wrote that and therefore you bought it and it sits on your shelf and you maybe read a page every now and again or you know that it's there if you get a certain problem, you can go and dip into it. But that's that's the use of a book and of a library. Not that it's a badge that I've read all these things, just that actually you think these are important things that if I want to refer to them, I can get to them quickly. Um, you know, and I think, I sort of try and tell myself that. I'm telling myself that now. So, um, yeah. I like but, the way you framed it. It's a good narrative. I think, yeah, you don't have to read everything. No, no. You don't have to own everything either, do you? But like the ones you own, I think you, you're probably saying, well, this is the level above the ones that I'll go out and find somewhere else. You know? Yeah, I've gone through a bit of a cull. Yeah. Recently, in terms of either giving them away or... Um, yeah, giving them to charity or giving them to other people who, who might benefit from them. Well, I think that's a lovely thing because I think like, you know, that's that's like, you know, you, you, you know where those things are. You could always go back and find them. Yeah. The things that you did read and if they've stuck with you, then they were worthwhile. Yeah. But giving them to someone else to to get some use out is, is, is exactly what we should be doing, I think. Yeah, 100%. Um, is there anything you've changed your mind about recently that you never thought you would? Change my mind about reason. So I'm, I'm constantly, again, sometimes is this, is this a positive or is this a, is this a bit of a curse? So I, I feel like I constantly change my mind. Mm. Um, but I feel, so like um, John Smart will say this a lot, like, you know, have strong beliefs loosely held. So until, until proven otherwise, um, go with that thing that, you know, and, and treat it with integrity and, and get fully behind it but be open to the fact that if anything disproves that thing that you you know held high um change your mind change your mind um i think probably the big shift recently or the big sort of um confirmation is um it sort of relates to agile is dead movement there's a lot of talk about agile is dead um and to some people you know it might be um and it, and it isn't to me um i think i think one of the things that i'm confirming in my head and um actually a, a, a pal of mine that i've worked with at, uh, an organization we're sort of putting something together that we might try and put out to some of the conferences and go and oh, try tease. and tell that story you elsewhere tease. yeah <laughs> but um but agile's not dead it's, we for, i think we've forgotten where it lives mm. um Interesting. what do you mean by that the um like sort of calling back to some of the things that we said earlier that um you know agile's for the people um it lives where people want it to it lives where people need it i think mm. and i think one of the big um 
penny drops for me or, or well it's not a penny drop it's like a slow realization uh as i've worked in more and more places is that um it's difficult it's diff it's not difficult to scale um but i think we've 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 jumped to some conclusions about how scaling should happen um and and whilst we might sort of talk about you know um we're, we're gardeners and we nurture um a lot of the scaling techniques do, do actually sort of um industrially farm uh those those concepts and those ideas and I, and I, and i think that quick approach to doing it um it that that's where agile dies mm -hmm. you know you're overwatering or you're putting in too much direct yeah. sunlight um and and it and it still lives in teams um and i think probably one of the most unfortunate things about that is and again this is things that uh, i think you and i have both even even with one another on on linkedin or in the social media we've, we've both joined in conversations and maybe even asked some of the questions about this is that um that whole thing about you know scrum master kanban coach agile coach the um the different degrees hierarchies of mm -hmm. of practitioner and and you know the different financial gains from those um and i think you know scrum, scrum masters are agile coaches yeah and scrum masters affect at a level of at a team level and then bolting another team on and bolting another team on that that's how that change happens that change has to happen like that um and sometimes and i think over time those industrial complexes of agile have forget that mm. and, and try and fast forward through it I think also that relates to, and I, and I wonder, I wonder about uh, maybe you, you share your views about the. We'll often get into conversations about if a scrum master's sc sc scrum mastering uh, more than one team, they're less effective. And I and I don't I don't necessarily think that I don't necessarily think that's right. I think it, what it means is there's been an evolution, and um, you know scrum masters can give their um, attention to more than one team as the system starts to behave in its own sort of um positive way yeah is that you, you needed less intensively in one place and people are responding well so actually they do it you want to work yourself out of a job i suppose don't you so actually getting further away and just fettling little bits means you can yeah i think do that over more people i think there's always a need for some sort of facilitation i think sometimes the community does scrum masters a bit of a disservice because it's and, and i and i get it because it's hard in some organizations because people want to see you know where do you go from being a scrum master are you going to be an agile yeah. coach yeah where do you go from being an agile coach you, you know an enterprise agile coach and i do have empathy for that because in a in a in a hierarchical structure which although may be changing that change is quite slow and we have to be real pragmatic and realistic with where we are so it can be difficult i think scrum masters sometimes or people in the agile community when they label themselves as a scrum master pen themselves in a box because yeah. kanban might be a more appropriate method or way of working that doesn't mean you have to shift the job title to now being a kanban master it's no. just yeah it's just the, the, the sh realizing that okay, Scrum with camp that doesn't mean you then become a Scrum master with a camp. Like you can get it's layering bricks on top of bricks that don't need to be there. I find sometimes, and that's where I think, although I haven't got a, a, a really a problem with the the Scrum master accountability, hmm. and I think that conversation is a bit boring. Yeah, I prefer the term agile practitioner. Because yeah. it's more broad, and to be honest, like we had um, Johnny Williams in in a, in a previous conversation, I haven't really got a problem with delivery manager because again, I think that could mean a lot of different things. And you may use Scrum, you may use Kanban, you may yeah. use a combination of both. You might use whatever else. So I think it is up to Scrum people in the Agile community, especially if you're labeling yourself as a Scrum master, to sort of think outside of the box a bit and realize you don't have to commit to one way of doing things and i think the rest of us have to help them get there especially if they're new to it because you yeah. do your two-day course and it's scrum all the way and i did it you know you, the scrum police 
you know, you're 16 minutes into your daily scrum, that's not allowed, blah, blah, blah. And I think we, if we were, if we were to admit it to ourselves or a vast, the vast majority of us, we've all been there. So let's mm-hmm. not, back to our point before, let's not forget where we've come from to help yeah. them see beyond it. Um, would be my take on it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, I completely agree with that. I completely agree with um, uh, doing away with some of those terms as well and, and having a broader, maybe a broader t- title to refer to. Yeah, but it is difficult, like I said, especially in those sort of big organizations where... You don't always get to choose, do you? <laughs> no, and people, <laughs> get you know, and people's pay is on the line, isn't it? You know, yeah. if, if, that, if Scrum Master to Senior Scrum Master is the next pay above... People are going to aim to be a senior scrum. Staff. Yes, and, and yeah, they will. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of unpicking to do there, I suppose. Um, what's next, Matt? What's next for you? Um, yeah, more of the same. I, I sort of view my career. Uh, you know, I don't know, this might sound a bit glib or twee. Um, you know, um, I'm an agile practitioner. Um, that's just walking a path with. Um, I don't know, all, all of the other people walking that path. There's no sort of set direction. Um, responding to calls for help. Um, I, I, I do enjoy working in the public sector. Um, again, that probably goes back to sort of like that political mm. uh, drive that I have that, um, in, you know, for better or for worse, for whatever uh, political... Um, movement is calling the shots at any given moment. Just on that, would you? Is politics something you would go into? Um, I doubt it. No, okay. I doubt. Um, act, act, so, I mean, activism may. I don't know really. Um, I would never say no to anything. Depends what came up and what else was. Uh, you just seem really passionate my about time. it. That's all. I sort of. Well, I just feel like politics is everywhere every day. Mm. Um, so I will often talk about you know in office politics people in our roles are office political activists we are actively showing people to choose different ways of of working so um and so a public sector uh i like working in the public sector because there's just a, a baked in purpose mm. that in one way shape or form it's supposed to be delivering value to all of us um and i l- would like to be in a position where i can help deliver value to all of us not just a yeah, yeah. certain part of a demographic or or market you know yeah. uh position um and so those and again those are sort of the um the wicked problems aren't they how do you how do you what problems do you solve that will benefit the most people or the and or the people most in need at any given moment um so probably there'll probably be more of that for me and um um though there are a lot of people that will often ask me for help in that area so i'm i'm, I'm very fortunate for, for for it not to be difficult for me to get involved in that i suppose and if people like what you've had to say today or like your posts or anything like that where would you like people to reach out to if you're happy for them to do so yeah absolutely yeah well linkedin linkedin is the is the place that i've uh i i share my ideas most uh that i'm most comfortable with um uh, you know, uh, putting, it's not pen to paper anymore, is it? But, uh, you know, tapping a keyboard out and putting my ideas out there. Um, I'm very verbose. My wife, Dinah, will, will tell a lot of people. So I feel um, hampered by Twitter. I can't fit it all in. I know you can do see loads of tweets, but I'd rather just put it out there. Yeah, I'm not on there. Yeah, no, it's just, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I should probably not be on there, but I, I sort of am a little bit. Uh, but yeah, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is great. Please reach out to me there and yeah. uh, ask me questions or interact with what I'm putting out. And... Well, I'll put your uh, URL in the, in the description and Thanks. people can, can head over there. Anything, any final words, Matt? Um, oh, what's jumped into my head just then is like Bill and Ted, be excellent to each other. But um, yeah, just, uh, yeah, just uh, you know, keep your chin up and um, keep looking for those problems. And yeah, fall in love with the problems. Um, Be kind to yourself. Thanks for listening to this month's episode. If you enjoyed the conversation, please let us know in the comments. And also, tell your mates, like and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.